So, Renato, does Judge Aileen Cannon have any idea what the hell she's doing? <sighs> it's complicated. I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So, I'm confused. <laughs> you and everybody else. I, I have to say, Asha, I can't think of a topic that is better suited for this podcast than <laughs> whatever it is that Aileen Cannon is doing. I literally spent, I, I spent time with multiple journalists from different publications like PBS News Hour and, and uh, Washington Post and so on, trying to help them understand what was going on because it was so confusing. It, it doesn't make sense, um, even if you are a lawyer. And I think a lot of us, you and I privately were trying to figure out and asking some questions this week about what the heck was going on. Yeah. So we've already discussed in a previous podcast, her weird jury instruction request, which was coming, as far as I can tell, like it was very cart horsing. Meaning, meaning she was putting the cart before the horse in the sense that we don't even have a trial date. And yet she's already was trying to get proposed jury instructions under two scenarios, both of which took as true Trump's interpretation of the Presidential Records Act or the legal relevance of the Presidential Records Act at a very bare minimum. Right. So just to review what we've already talked about in a prior podcast, jury instructions are an important part of a trial process. A judge decides what the law is and decides what she's going to instruct the jury regarding the law because the jury decides the flat facts and applies her instructions regarding the law to the facts. Very important. Trials are won and lost on those jury instructions. Jury instruction conferences in some cases occur in the middle of trial. In a criminal case, often they occur before trial, but usually a week or two before. And not not always are all of the disputes regarding jury instruction settled going into trial. But nonetheless, it's something you do right around trial time. And that's when, you know, all the issues have been hashed out. And the question is, what is the law? And what are we going to instruct the jury? Out of nowhere, though, before, as you point out, Asha, before you, we even have a trial date, Judge Cannon throws out a couple of ideas that she wants potential jury instructions from both sides uh, for without even making a decision as to what the law is, which is very, very bizarre. That spurred our conversation last time, but obviously things have fast forwarded since that time. Yes. So basically, in response to her request for suggested jury instructions based on whether basically the two scenarios are either the jury gets to decide whether the classified documents that were found at Trump's home were personal or presidential, or they can decide that classified documents transmorgify into personal records when the president takes them home, which would basically give him an absolute defense. So they were both weird. Um, one would automatically give Trump an acquittal if the jury uh, agreed with it. <clears throat> the other one gave him a very strong out. We discussed this with Brian Greer. Um, Jack Smith was having none of it. He was He was done. Like, I feel like he was like, this has gotten stupid. Yes, but it's it's actually that you could sense the urgency and almost I wouldn't say fear, but uh, maybe fear uh, coming from from his side there, because, you know, the reason that I emphasize the timing here is that once a trial begins, 
something called jeopardy attaches, which I can, we can explain. But after that point, you can't have a second trial. And if the defendant is found not guilty, the government cannot appeal. So if, for example, she waited to have a decision until the middle of trial, make a decision about jury instructions, Jack Smith may not be able to appeal if ultimately, as you per- suggested, that it results in an acquittal for Trump. So Smith was, I would like to say, begging her to reach a decision before trial, but he almost was indignant about it, right? Throwing down the gauntlet, like, you need to make a decision before trial. And she had none of it. Yeah. So before we get there, and just to emphasize your point, Jeopardy or double Jeopardy attaches or Jeopardy, I guess, attaches when the jury is sworn in. It's not after the jury reaches a verdict. It's actually when the jury is sworn in after that point, a defendant can't be tried on those same set of facts under the federal constitution, um, or at least the double, double by jeopardy the state clause. by the federal government. So as you said, Jack wouldn't, Jack Smith would not be able to try him again once, once a jury is sworn in. So that's a pretty, a fairly early stage of trial, right? And so as you know, even if she is completely hands down wrong on the law, he has no recourse after that time. And he was, I, I don't know how you would characterize his tone. I would not call it pleading. I would call it him basically calling her out. And he bas- he basically told her that her entire jury instruction scenario, both A and B, rested on an incorrect legal premise. He did. And, and that it had nothing, that both of, the, that, that underlying premise was wrong. That the Presidential Records Act has, as you would say in Spanish, nada que ver, nothing to do with this entire case. It's not a defense to the Espionage Act. And what I loved about his response is he basically calls out the fact that this was a legal theory concocted out of whole cloth by Tom Fitton, who we discussed before, the non-lawyer who was trying to get some tapes that were located in Clinton's sock drawer, sock drawer. So, um, and he puts that all in there and basically says, this has never surfaced before. And then he says that he needs a ruling from her because if she insists on her interpretation of the law of the presidential records act and its relevance, which he believes is incorrect, that he would seek a writ of mandamus from the court of appeals. So maybe you want to break that down. Yes. So that, the reason I just, to give some context here, uh, how extraordinary his filing was, typically lawyers are very polite with judges and they don't, um, they're not trying to be this in your face with a judge. Um, it is extraordinarily rare for a lawyer, much less a federal prosecutor to tell a judge, we are going to mandamus you, which we'll get to in a minute, or, you know, essentially going as far as he did in telling her that she's doing the wrong thing. And there's a reason why, because judges, and we'll circle back to this later as well, judges have extraordinary discretion. Um, And, you know, the government's a repeat player uh, as well uh, in the court business, so, so to speak, the Department of Justice. So you have to be very thoughtful and careful and respectful of judges. Um, but mandamus, which you mentioned a moment ago, it's actually a writ. Um, and what it's, it's essentially, a, it's, it's kind of an, uh, an old thing in law, but basically, if you believe that a decision has been reached that is so clearly erroneous and would, it is essentially mi- hitting at the integrity of the proceedings and undermines the integrity of the proceedings, you can seek a writ of mandamus from the Court of Appeals and immediately appeal. But it is an extraordinary remedy that is, and it is very, 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 very rarely granted. The thing that I want to highlight though, is I said it's in response to a decision made by the court. And one thing that part of what was going on 
that Jack Smith was writing around in his brief is that she hadn't made a decision yet. And so really she, he, there's nothing for him to mandamus at that point. And that is why I said there's an element where he's almost pleading her to, with her to make a decision. Yeah. I mean, basically he's telling her that she needs to make explicit the legal premise on which she is, was basing her jury instruction order. In other words, there was an unstated premise, and he said, you need to make this premise clear. It was a response to her order, but would that be considered, like, a motion in itself? Like, ask, like a request of the court to which he needs to respond separately? Because we'll get to how she did respond, which was to a different thing. If that is really a motion, uh, it's a very poorly uh, framed one. I, I don't find this sort of, like, making casual st- Request to the judge in a, in a, a pre existing filing to be a motion. I mean, judges will sometimes say, I'm going to construe that as a motion for whatever, but, um, particularly in this case, you know, where, you know, if I, if I was on the defense side, right, I would say there's the judge hasn't decided anything and he's not asking you to decide anything, judge. He's giving you his arguments and he's taking pot shots at the court for some reason. I don't know why, judge, he's doing that, but you, you know, Take your time and, you know, we're, we're far away from any trial date here. Um, so, you know, he can, uh, twist to the wind in the meantime, because this isn't ripe for any sort of discussion, because we're just, just, we're discussing alternatives and potential, you know, potential argument, legal arguments at this point. That's all we're doing. Okay. So he did not make a, it, it was not a formal motion. It was a response to something that she requested from the parties. Though he's pointing out that she needs to make a final decision because of all the implications that it has, including that that jeopardy would attach and it would prejudice the government uh, if she waited. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, she then rules on a motion to dismiss, which had been filed by Trump's lawyers. Also based on the Presidential Records Act, basically this idea that it's an absolute defense, um, you know, and that he can't be charged with this crime at all. And she denies that motion and she bases her denial on. Tell me if I'm understanding this again, I find this all very hard to parse because I don't understand how her brain works. She said it's premature. Um, to consider this, right? Because like nothing in the indictment mentions the Presidential Record Act, uh, Records Act. P.S. It doesn't mention it because it has nothing to do with the case. But anyway, so she says she she kind of seemed to be reading the indictment and saying that there was no reference to the Presidential Records Act, and therefore making this link that that Trump couldn't. Like it would not be appropriate to dismiss the case based on that legal argument. So yeah, so here's what I would say: her 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 decision was correct, yeah. Um, but it's very technical. So here's in in, but she she what she did, I don't think anyone could dispute on either side really. In a mo at the motion to dismiss stage in a criminal case, really, it's the same. It's roughly the same in a civil case. The allegations in the indictment are presumed to be true, which is why these motions <laughs> almost never succeed because mm-hmm. the government's going to write the indictment to make the defendant sound super sinister. Okay. So Trump's doing all these evil things and obstructing justice and so on and so forth. And we're, and that's how Jack Smith wrote the indictment. So of course, on those facts, um, there's, there's no absolute bar to prosecution under those facts. What she's saying is essentially, there's no facts here that would enable me on their on their own to deter to reach the result that you want me to reach. It may be a trial that you can mount some sort of defense, but it's going to require different evidence. And at this point, all we have are the allegations in the indictment, and I have to presume those to be true. And so you lose. Technically speaking, that is correct. What everyone needs to understand before um, you drown out uh, Judge Cannon's ruling with th- you know thunderous applause before the, all the thunderous applause ends, it all, all it does it's not inconsistent with her giving him some out in a jury instruction. Right. So I'm looking at it right now. So she says, 
The motion is denied, bound by the four corners of the superseding indictment. So she's basically kind of using the rule that you just said, like, I'm bound to look at how this indictment is written and accept the allegations as true. And she says, the counts make no reference to the Presidential Records Act, nor do they rely on that statute for purposes of stating an offense. Then she says, for these reasons, the Presidential Records Act does not provide a pretrial basis to dismiss. And then she just kind of leaves it there. But then she goes on to say that separately, I'm not going to make any legal determinations on the, this this issue meeting the Presidential Records Act, as the special counsel has asked. Um, and she's basically leaving it open to decide, I guess, later in trial, including after the jury has been sworn in. And she says, the court's order soliciting preliminary draft instructions on certain counts should not be misconstrued as declaring a final definition on any essential element or asserted defense in this case, nor should it be interpreted as anything other than what it was, a genuine attempt in the context of the upcoming trial to better understand the party's competing positions and the questions to be submitted to the jury in this complex case of first impression. As always, any party remains free to avail itself of whatever appellate options it sees fit to invoke as permitted by law. So she's basically like, go ahead and mandamus me. Let me see what, you know, tr like do it, like bring it. Because he can't, because he can't. And, and so this is what I'm going to say, because this is such a, this is going to be a bit of a departure from our, our take. I think not just my takeaway, but our takeaway, <laughs> at least the takeaway I had in our last, uh, I'll own it myself in our last podcast, which was, you know, there's no, you know, Canon may be a lot of things, but she's not it. One thing she isn't, I think I said last time is she's not a real savvy operator trying to help Trump in some sort of super, like some super clever way, like Bill Barr or Alan Dershowitz, where they say these things that are very cleverly written and said to like skirt around things. You know, w w the reason I said that was because if she's really, and this is a point you've made, Ash, as well. If she really wanted to help Trump out and like set him free, then raising this jury instruction thing from the beginning was really a ham handed way to do it because it really tipped her hand. Yeah, she could have just kept it on the down low, right? Like she could have just right. let everything just kind of plot along, wait for the jury to be sworn in, and then somewhere allow him to start, you know, to give his presidential records act defense. And then at that point, I assume Smith would have said, you know, made a, I guess that would be a motion in limine to not allow a defense. Does that count? As yeah. Evidence, I, I mean, um, so, so that's, we can get to that in terms of what he, what he could yeah, do yeah. next. So, well, he would have, he would have, he would have objected to it in some way. She would have said, no, I'm going to allow it. And then even though she would be plainly wrong, there would be nothing that he could do. Trump goes to the end. She gives crazy jury instructions. He gets acquitted. There's nothing that he can do. Like that's, that's the sneaky way to do it. And she's like trying to be, you know, like a villain in a Scooby-Doo movie where she's like plomping around with like, you know, a, a mask over her head. You know what I mean? Like it's very obvious. Right. It's super obvious. That she's the caretaker. Now yeah. this though, this move was very savvy, which she did in this order. She basically is telling Jack Smith, and that's why I, I kind of previewed this when we are talking about what Jack Smith was doing. You know, if you're going to shoot at the king, you better not miss. With, with a judge, they hold all the cards. And as a litigant, if you're going to go out there and be like, I'm going to mandamus you and you're clearly wrong in this and that, she's like, no, you're not. You don't have anything to mandamus. I'm not going to decide anything. I am no under no obligation to decide anything. There's been no final decision on anything. I'm putting that in black and white. So there's going to be no basis for you to mandamus anything because I haven't decided anything. Good luck with that, Jack Smith. And you know what? Right now, as of the moment that we're recording this podcast on a Tuesday, that is true. Now, can Jack Smith do something about this? The answer is maybe. In other words, he can make a motion. You typically, with jury instructions, this you you know often you'll have competing jury instructions set out. The judge may not make a decision on certain ones until at, in the middle of trial. Often, in my experience, although I've 
heard on Twitter from people from different jurisdictions who have a different experience. In my experience, usually the main issues get hashed out pre-trial. Okay, but not always. But um, he could file a motion to eliminate and say, I want to preclude this defense by Trump. Try to force a decision pre-trial. But you know what she could do? She could say, I'm going to take that under advisement. I want to hear the evidence first before I make a ruling on that. What is he going to do with that? Is he going to mandamus that? Taking it under advisement? Like, you get what I mean? Like, she can really, there's a lot of discretion that district judges have. And I think you and I have said from the beginning, Asha, that she really wants to be clever here with the broad discretion that a district judge has. Like, can she tank this thing for Trump? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you a few questions on that. But I do feel like her response was defensive. Like, so, you know, I keep going back to why did she even bother doing these jury instructions and making this like whole thing like a thing, right? Um, it, it, it can't be that she is totally in the bag for Trump because if that was the case, then she could have been smarter about it. I mean, maybe she might still be in the bag for Trump, but my point is, is that this was a dumb way. Unless, and this is what I said when we were talking with Brian Greer, she's in way over her head. I don't think she understands anything about anything. And I think like for her, remember I've called this whole Presidential Records Act thing a smart defense for dumb people. And so it sounds really clever and like, ooh, you know, this is something. And I think she's bought into it. And I think she wanted to, I think there's two possibilities that are not mutually exclusive. One, to single signal to the Trump team, I'm really thinking hard about, you know, this this complex legal theory. This is like why she's like, it's such a complex case. Um, or she wants to signal to the public that she's like, you know, really thinking through all these hard legal issues and in the process she's making a fool of herself and then when she like what jack smith showed like he kind of called her out and was like this is a smart defense for dumb people and by do by going down this road you look really dumb and so i think she's now trying to backpedal because it sh i think it might be dawning on her that she's cornered herself that either she has to concede that she's wrong or she has to stick to her guns that this is something that's a viable defense or or interpretation and then be smacked down. I think like now she like she doesn't know what to do. And I think that's what's going to keep her from making any kind of decision. It's interesting. I mean, I, it's hard to get. I mean, I, I will say I don't have a complete read on Judge Cannon. I think, I mean, clearly she's favorable towards Donald Trump. I don't, I'm not suggesting that I, I haven't figured that out, but I mean, this order, that portion of this order was, was savvy on her part. I'm just going to say that. I don't know. Maybe she's not the one who came up with it. Okay. Um, maybe somebody gave her that idea. I don't know, but it's savvy. Um, Tom Fitton. Yeah. It could, well, <laughs> who knows who it could be? It could be another judge. It could be whatever. I, I have no idea, but it's a savvy uh, response. I mean, I think she can totally say face at any point by just saying, I was exploring ideas and considering the party's positions. This is a first of its kind case. Like she just said, you know, the president, former president of the United States on one side of it. Uh, you know, this is the whole world's watching. I want to make sure I hear every, everybody's arguments and I want to see what those alternatives would look like. I've considered it and I find that persuasive. You know, she could totally do that. Like to say, I mean, I don't, would anyone care at the end of the day on Jack Smith's side? If at the end of the day, she's like, you know what? I think you're right, Jack Smith. Thanks for all the very, uh, comprehensive authority. But I don't think, I honestly feel like she doesn't believe she can say that. I, I don't know if she's a, like, I think she's afraid of Trump. I think she's afraid of that whole, the whole MAGA movement because if she, like he has hung his hat on this thing. They all believe it. They all believe the presidential record act records act is his out. And if she were to say, no, she knows that, that the first thing he's going to do is get on truth social and slam her. And maybe it's just that reputational harm to, you know, in this base that she cares what they think maybe she's actually afraid of like violence or threats you know if if she rules against him i don't know i don't know that she is willing to discard it because he's relying so heavily on it 
what if, okay, I'm going to give you a totally different spin on it. What if by delaying a ruling on this till trial, she's leaving her options open? Because I don't think you and I are any un, under any delusion that this case is going to trial before the November election, right? There's no trial date even set uh, at this point. So she's going to see if he wins? Yeah. And then Why not see if he wins? And, and her interpretation of the law is going to depend on whether he wins or not? I don't know. But my I mean, point is, is not, I don't that, know that her. That makes her even worse. <laughs> I don't know her. I, I'm like, just saying, okay. I don't know her. I've never met her. I'm just trying. I mean, this is me trying to make sense of a situation um, here. I don't know. But the point is, she is certainly not committing herself to anything right now. And in fact, she's deciding a bunch of motions that Trump's co-defendants have filed without deciding Trump's motions. So she's scheduling hearing dates for other motions by the other co-defendants, but still holding Trump's motions. She could have scheduled those. It's clear to me that there's just more, there's mounting evidence that she is in no hurry to proceed to trial in, you know, with Donald Trump. So if that's the case, um, you know, she may just punt on all of this, see how things develop and make a decision much closer to the trial date. And people who are upset and about to flood our comments with angry messages. Don't, first of all, don't hate the player, hate the game. Okay. I'm not, I'm not the one setting the rules here, but I think, you know, Jack Smith's options are limited. I mean, he could file a motion and eliminate now, which she could potentially say is too, is premature. And just, you know, she could just say, I'm just a timing thing. It's premature to file motions to limiting. We're not even, we don't even have a trial date. Uh, you can file some motion on it that she just holds in a, you know, she just holds it, sits on it. Or he, she, they could try to recuse her. And that's, that standard is extraordinarily high. And by the way, before people are like, well, isn't there enough? And why can't you recuse? If recusal was something that you could get without an extraordinary uh, number of hoops, we will be filing it in every in in I wouldn't say every case, but yeah. But I think you know until now I have been um, more on your side that like oh my god no they're, they're you know she's not going to get recused when she's acting like a complete crazy cake. I mean you know and deliberate like it's clear that like it's clear to any objective person. Whatever way you go on this, that this will be a very, could be a dispositive legal issue. Like it's something that should be decided, right? It, very hard to get, to get recused for something you do in your capacity as a judge, you know? Um, and she has this track record. I mean, she got smacked down for abusing her discretion the first time around she's she's highlighted that that trump is a different kind of defendant like she she's actually said in black and white that she doesn't you know that he's that she's not administering equal justice before the law when it comes to him yeah i look there's no question that what she did prior in before the case was filed before the indictment was was issued in this case in that prior bizarro civil suit that Trump filed trying mean, after the search warrant. That was crazy. The 11th circuit r regarded it as such and issued a scathing opinion. True. I think one thing that's been brimming beneath the surface here in the criminal case is that Jack Smith's just waiting for his opportunity to like do something here to get this in front of the 11th circuit. And she's trying to avoid giving him that opportunity. She's been much more careful in the criminal case what she's done has been much more within what a district judge can do. And the stuff that she has been playing around with, like the calendar, that's the sort of thing that you're never going to, no court of appeals is ever going to do much, anything about. And I don't know here whether there's enough because she really hasn't even decided anything. And that's, she purposely, purposely, that's why I said such a savvy move on her part, purposely put that in writing so that it's crystal clear because that's guaranteed what the other side's going to cite to the court of appeals. Like, judge, she hasn't even decided anything yet. Maybe someday this guy can mandamus or recuse her, but not today. I wish I had better news, but I, I think that that piece of this is why I said this was a perfect, a uh, uh, perfect topic for it's complicated because people are 
going to be frustrated with this, but I really think it's kind of built into our system that district judges have lots of discretion about things like timing and when they make decisions. Well, I think Jack Smith is smarter than Aileen Cannon, and I will, I'm interested to see what his next move is. I am equally interested in that. So Asha, uh, I, you know, in case anyone thought this immunity stuff was behind us, we've been dealing with immunity motions. It seems like in every case uh, from Donald Trump, Donald Trump recently, in addition to seeing Jack Smith's response on the immunity, uh, mo- you know, on the immunity, uh, uh, you know, case in front of the Supreme Court, it's been interesting to say. Uh, I think Trump is viewed that as sort of I wouldn't say his get out of jail free card, but is Create instant delay card. Yeah, it's immunity insanity. <laughs> wow, we have a great we have a great thumbnail uh, for our mm-hmm. YouTube uh, mm-hmm. our YouTube uh, uh, channel for this episode. Immunity so, insanity. So he's bringing it up in the eleventh hour in New York, and the judge basically ruled on a t- as a timing issue there. Okay essentially said without reaching the merits there at all, because the merits would require potentially a delay after the Supreme court may issued its ruling because he could at least say, cause he just, so we were clear the hush money thing, the pay, the hush money scheme was hatched before Trump was president, but the payments occurred while he was president. And he's saying that his like tweets, one or two of the payments happened. Was it one or two in 2017? Yeah, I don't recall. Yeah, after he was formally inaugurated. And he's saying that his tweets were official statements about Cohen being his lawyer or something or another. But, you know, nonetheless, the judge would have to make factual determinations about that. And, you know, typically a judge would want to have the Supreme Court's ruling first. So what the judge decided was solely on timing grounds. You know, this is too late. And I expect... That we're going to get some something filed by Trump's team saying you can't waive this, and it's you know the sort of argument that you can raise at any time, and so on. So I do think there's there's a fight that's still ongoing. I believe they're trying to go to the Court of Appeals on this, right, Asha? The New York Court of Appeals. That's right. In 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 New York, right? They're trying to appeal this up. There's been some emergency filings recently, and so forth. Yeah, and of course, this was also raised in Georgia. Right. So this is popping up. This is what happens when you have a former president who's been indicted four different cases at the same time. It's, it's a great, it's a great fit for this, the, this podcast because it's complicated, right? This was raised originally in the federal case in DC. Uh, that's up up to, up to the Supreme Court. And by the way, I mean, the ruling that we can expect and we can get to this in a minute is, you know, there'll be, there may be very, fact intensive in terms of whether or not Trump is immune in that case. And then there's these other cases. And, you know, so Judge Cannon still, I think she has to make a determination regarding immunity in Mar, in the Mar-a-Lago case. We have this filing in New York. You know, my guess is the New York courts, um, probably aren't going to give Trump an out, uh, pre-trial, but you never know. That's one of the only things that could delay that trial. And then in, in Georgia, he's had, I think, uh, my recollection is that got resolved as well, right? The, the judge de- de- denied that motion in Georgia. They denied it, yeah. And I think it's interesting to look at the timeline across which these, for the underlying conduct in these trials, right? The New York trial is for conduct that largely, except for these couple of payments or whatever, preceded him becoming president. The January 6th events, obviously, both the federal January 6th case and the Georgia RICO case were for acts while he was president. And then the Mar-a-Lago case is about acts after he was president, but kind of in the inverse of the New York thing. Like there's like a little thread of, you know, stuff like, I mean, I don't know, I guess the boxes of classified documents must have been loaded up on a plane like you know while like before noon on on january 20th or something like that so there's like some small thread that um you know flows from the presidency so he's really trying to make this i mean i think it's kind of extraordinary if you think about it like he is really claiming this immunity 
from criminal prosecution for criminal prosecution, by the way, so already extending this existing precedent, which which has been found to apply in the civil context to acts performed in the outer perimeter of a president's duties. He wants to extend it to a criminal context, and he wants to extend it to things that he did before he was president, during the time he was president, and then after he left office. So basically, he's not ever able to be prosecuted, is his theory correct and that's why he proceeds it always with the term absolute right he's not asking mm-hmm. for limited immunity or partial immunity uh he's asking for absolute immunity like i am above the law i am your sun god or whatever louis the 14th uh you know let us say wow whatever <laughs> i am raw the sun god. right well i mean isn't that wasn't that was well isn't that what wasn't that louis whole thing right louis the 14th you know the let us say moi i'm the state uh, and yes. he was i think the sun was his emblem right and that was the idea it's like he was a he is the the state right and so trump is above the law very literally is that what he wants now just to to get into the weeds here a little bit with jack smith's filing you know one thing that we've talked about before is that the the supreme court when it took the immunity case wrote in its question presented it kind of cleaned up and made trump's argument much better trump's argument was for absolute immunity and the Supreme Court's question presented, which is how the Supreme Court frames the issue before it was, you know, whether and to what extent there's, a, a, you know, presidential immunity for official acts while in office. And it really, to me, tipped their hand. And I wasn't the first one to say this. Jack Goldsmith and others said that um, regarding, you know, the fact that they may find limited immunity in certain circumstances. And if you read Jack Smith's brief, a whole section of it is even if there is immunity, there isn't, shouldn't be immunity for the January 6th case, which could be very interesting because it could make the ultimately two things. First of all, the criminal landscape could become narrower for Trump. He might face certain cases and not others, but I think it could slow everything down because you could imagine a circumstance in which judges have to carefully apply the Supreme Court's opinion to the allegations in each one of these cases before proceeding onward. Yeah, so I'll say a few things about that. I mean, it's typically been, or at least I understand it. I mean, you can tell me what you what you remember from your law school days is that it's a canon of jurisprudence that courts should not pronounce on big big things, right? I mean, if they if there is a narrow way to make a ruling, you want things to happen incrementally. And I think that's where Jack Smith is going, is that he's saying this is not, and he even made this argument to the Court of Appeals. Like, you know, A, my my primary argument is that there's no immunity from criminal prosecution. Like that doesn't apply. Um, that's a, you know, all of the policy underpinnings that make it something that we might want in the civil context don't apply in the criminal context for a number of reasons. All of those were hashed out in the court of appeals. But then he makes this argument in the alternative where he says, even if there were to be some daylight in this, these are not the facts on which you want to make a big pronouncement about such, like such a big thing, you know? Um, And if I'm not mistaken, his, Final argument is that to the extent that there would be, you know, there is some question on whether, you know, that there is some immunity for official acts in the criminal context, that that should be a factual uh, question for the jury. And so I think like he really just wants this trial to move on because that's the big key, right? Because you could see that you could see a situation where the Supreme Court does what's going on in the civil context where they want this, you know, to be a legal issue that the district court figures out before the trial starts, which would delay it as opposed to, you know, what Jack Smith is saying, like in his, for him, he wants the worst case scenario to be okay. Then this is going to be a question that 
um, has to be decided by the jury. So we'll have to present evidence that this was he was doing all this in his personal capacity as a candidate. Trump would have to present evidence to the jury that this was all official acts and, and the jury would ultimately decide. Is that do you feel like that the, those are kind of like the three tiers of his argument? Yeah, I think that sounds I think that sounds about right. Um, I, I will just say, by the way, one thing that as I heard you discussing this that I find rather remarkable here, and I, I want to articulate this and note it, is how much this special counsel, Jack Smith, is motivated to have a trial in a speedy fashion before the election begins. It is does not need to be that way. And it's remarkable and interesting. In other words, I think if Robert Mueller was a special counsel, I think he'd be like, well, let's take our time with this. Let's be fair. Let's give him as much time as he needs to mount a defense. Jack Smith is, in it's interesting that he sees the urgency that a lot of our viewers and listeners see and is very intent to do whatever he possibly can to move this forward in a very intense and deliberate way. And it's unusual um, and interesting because prosecutors usually are juggling multiple cases and are not as motivated. He sees the urgency here. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court does. I mean, whether the Supreme Court plays ball with that or not. Well, Jack Smith has prosecuted heads of state. I mean, he, he I think, knows better than anyone what's at stake for not only someone who ends up in a position where they have these huge levers of power. I mean, we're already seeing the implications of that in many of these legal arguments, but someone who is hell bent on abusing that power, right? I mean, his previous, you know, targets have been like, you know, heads of state who committed war crimes and stuff like that. Um, you know, and I'm sure not for nothing, but like, you know, in dictatorships, the guy who tried to prosecute the the president who then becomes president, you know, the, the prosecutor doesn't end up faring so well. So, you know, um, <laughs> it's true. So, you know, I think he has a number of reasons to want this to go forward. And I think more than anything, though, this does seem to be about, you know, it's just interesting that these are all crimes that kind of are underpinning, like, distortions in, in our electoral process, et cetera, except maybe the Mar-a-Lago case. But um, he's trying to bring some clarity and to make sure that people are making an informed vote, I think, at the very least. Right. It's just, it. look, it's interesting. I think it's something that's going to be discussed for many, many decades to come. It's not a typical thing a prosecutor's interested in. And I think as people look back in this moment, particularly those of you who are very critical of what Merrick Garland has done or not done. You know, we've talked about how I'm very I, critical of what Merrick Garland did not do. Well, we've talked about how I think the history books are going to look back on that. And that's going to be something that is going to be debated and discussed for years to come. Jack Smith's going to be a historical figure for years to come. Just like when I was in law school, and we were learning about what Leon Jaworski did. Okay. I think what Jack Smith is doing here is going to be very consequential it may end up getting stymied. I know I'm a wet blanket with Judge Gannon. I don't know. Uh, it may, the Supreme Court, who knows what they're going to do. But Jack Smith, I think, is doing everything possible to get a trial done before the election. And he's down to his last, you know, it's almost like all the X wings are going at the Death Star and you're down to one. And it's like, is it Luke Skywalker and he get, going to get, get it done? He's got one case left that realistically can go to trial before the election. And that is that January 6th case. And um, all the other stuff is just an attempt by Trump to slow down these other trials. But that's really, I think, the kit and caboodle right there is the January 6th case. And I think that will change, um, you know, how we discuss United States history and how Donald Trump is discussed, whether or not that case goes to trial before the election. So before we go... I had a great date night with my wife and we ended up going to a board game store. And I will just tell you, board games are not my wife's favorite thing. She thinks that they are often very complicated and I love board games. I'm a huge board game nerd and have, I'm super into strategy games and have been since I was a kid. She's not into them. And we have, 
at times tried to find board games that work for both of us. We found yet another one on our date night. And I'm just super curious because I'm a, from a board game family, super into board games. Are you into board games? I am not into board games. Okay. You and my wife are like peace and peace and carrots. Like she does not find that fun at all. And I wish I were a board. Like, I wish I were that person. I wish I were you because you know, I know people who are like, we all played a board game on Friday night, whole family. And it's, I mean, you know, sounds fun, but it's just not. And here's the thing. I feel like when I start playing a board game, I can get into it. Okay. It's just that the prospect of playing a board game, if there's like, like of all the things that I could possibly do is not something that I would really love to do. Like I'd rather go to the movies like to me that's really fun and exciting um i i i don't mind putting together puzzles like that you know if you know if you're sitting around a table doing something together like i don't know what it is i have a block i love you see i i love playing games when i was a kid my parents that was something we did in the holidays we'd all play games and that was fun card games board games that sort of thing um and when i and when i was younger i used to get there's this company Avalon Hill that made like strategic war games with, you know, with car gate cardboard parts, you know, of different things. And I would get these games at garage sales and flea markets and stuff. And I would play them solo. I enjoyed it so much. I love board games. So I love the strategic element of it. But I think from my wife's perspective, like the board game is only fun if it's simple enough that she doesn't have to think about the rules and just can have fun. And so, like, if it's like a lot of rules and she's got to spend time learning it and figuring it out and strategizing, then it's not fun. She just wants to drink her glass of wine and like roll some dice and see if she wins. Yeah, same. I'm like, let's do Parcheesi or. Yes. You know, um, I'll, I'll take that back. There are some, if they're interactive and like fun, you know, I don't, I like Pictionary. Um, there's a game called Cranium, which I remember I played a few right. times. So just, Fun party uh, game. Yeah, those kinds of things where you're trying, you'd have a partner and you're trying to, you know, um, it involves like some creativity. I, I kind of like those. Um, Cards Against of- Humanity. Do you like that one? Oh, I love cards. See? I played Cards Against Humanity a few weeks ago. There you go. Yes. Oh. Well, and so- you know, Cards Against Humanity you can you really play with like people that you're close friends with so it's also like i said i feel like there's a bonding element you're laughing like anything where you're laughing and it's funny to me that's appealing versus like pandemic and we're all working together to stop the zombie you know the yeah or like virus. risk or something or so, right. I, I don't know like i'm like i don't feel like going to like playing a war game and i love that stuff so i love risk I've played really complicated games that take all night. I think that's just a lot of fun, but it's just a different way of thinking about fun, I guess. I guess. What were your favorite games when you were a kid? I did like games when I was a kid. I liked Sorry. Okay. Which is basically Parcheesi, I think. Yeah, that's that's a straightforward game. I Um, I did like Risk a lot when I was a kid and Axis and Allies, which is like Risk and Steroids. You remember Axis and Allies? No. no, Gary, I guess not. No. I like that's Connect a nerd four. game. Okay, we've already established of the two of us, I was the nerd, right? Yeah, I like so. Connect Four. <laughs> that's so my wife's kind of game. That's my like, wife's kind of game. I liked Payday. So, would you like Yahtzee? Uh, wait, that's the dice. That's right, the dice. And then what do you do? And then you you select like is a four of a kind or Yahtzee or three. You don't remember this? No, full I don't house? remember that. I don't think I played that. So th- we got a game this week. My wife and I got that's basically Yahtzee's on steroids. Yeah. And she's enjoying that because it's just a, it's similar. You just throw dice and it's like, okay, did I get a six or something? Like that's like you know what I mean? Do I have some ones or sixes or threes or whatever it is? Like that's easier for to sort of okay just have fun and not think too much about. It. Yeah. Wow. Well, very different uh, categories of fun. You're not playing Settlers of Catan with me or anything like that. No. It doesn't sound. I like. think I did like Battleship. Remember, you sunk my Battleship, and you had like, uh, yeah, of course. Up and then that's sort of a strategy. I don't know that I fully. I was pretty young. I don't know that I always <laughs> understood all the rules. I just liked the ships and having them <laughs> on my side. Did you board. have the one that like like had little sounds that you'd play? 
And then I think I did. Oh, speaking of sounds, operation. Okay, that was fun. I was very good at operation. You were. I should have been a doctor. Your parents said the same thing. (laughs) M S W Media.